But Inya Chow has shown that there were stirrings against footbinding among the literati before the arrival of the Christians. But the real resistance only begins after the intrusions of the missionaries and the return in the 1890s in the first decade of the new century of increasing young numbers of young Chinese men and women who had studied abroad. Among them in particular were young women from the gentry and the prosperous merchant classes who had been sent to Japan and who came back committed to educating a new generation of Chinese girls, both physically and mentally, for a more emancipated world. These were China's first feminists committed to women's equality. The schools they started put physical education, sports and exercise at the heart of the curriculum. That practice presupposed that women's feet should not be bound. The missionaries had made their way into the whole country, insisting on their right to do so with gunboats from without and lawsuits enforcing their treaty rights within. By 1894, as John King Fairchild and Merrill Goldman write, the Protestant mission effort supported over 1,300 missionaries, mainly British, American, and Canadian, and maintained some 500 stations, each with a church, residences, street chapels, usually a small school, and possibly a hospital or dispensary, in about 350 different cities and towns. And yet, in this country of more than 400 million people, there were not yet 60,000 Chinese converts. The numbers rose at a slightly higher rate in the 1890s, but still reached little more than 100,000 by 1900. Starting in the 1860s, domestic reformers from the literati, led by the same Zheng Guofan who had orchestrated the defeat of the Taiping rebels, argued for what they called, somewhat misleadingly, self-strengthening. Zheng Guofan's younger colleague, uh, a man called Li Hongshang, wrote to Beijing in 1864, explaining that China faced what he called the greatest crisis since its unification under the first emperor in 221 BC. That's obviously our calendar. Li's solution was that the Chinese should begin to borrow Western technology and train its own people to make and use it. Arguments like these were resisted by the literati. They were not taken in by the Chinese-sounding slogan of self-strengthening. They saw that it meant adopting the modernization by Westernization that the Japanese were undergoing. And like a multitude of Bartleby's, they preferred not to. Not only did they dislike the local modernizers, they regarded the foreign Christians as a threat to their own status as the intellectual voice of their civilization. The persistent opposition of Protestant missionaries, especially women, to the practice of footbinding was one of many points of contention. Christian schools for girls began to be opened in the 1860s in many parts of the country. In Hangzhou, in the Yangtze River Delta, the church mission opened a school for girls in 1867, which required from the first that the feet of the girls should be unbound and they should not be compelled to marry against their consent. Similarly, when the Methodists opened a girls' school in Beijing, they required all the girls to have their feet unbound. In 1874, the Reverend John McGowan of the London Mission Society, one of the most important organizations in the Protestant missions in China, who had been a championing for some 15, campaigning for some 15 years against foot binding, along with his wife, called a meeting of Christian women in Shanmen then known in English for a reason I don't understand as Amoy, uh, along the coast from Canton. Quote, at the end of the meeting, nine women signed the pledge to eradicate the heathen practice in their homes and beyond by drawing a cross against their names written by a Chinese pastor. Eventually, other, mostly working class women, joined up, pledging not to bind the feet of their daughters and undergoing the painful process of unbinding their already bound feet. But progress was slow. For decades, the McGowans went about their work recruiting to their Quit Footbinding Society, which echoed the name of the Quit Opium Smoking Societies that had uh, founded, uh, been founded earlier, sort of uh, Chinese uh, Opium Addicts Anonymous. So the Quit Footbinding Society of the McGowans was the first anti-footbinding society in China. The missionaries conducted their campaigns of reform, reform not only by offering conversion, education, medicine, and unbound feet to the illiterate poor, but also by addressing the literati. They set up newspapers and magazines uh, written in classical Chinese, including, for example, the Review of the Times, uh, founded in 1868 by the Reverend Young, John Young Allen of the American Southern Method Methodist Episcopal Mission, and edited by him until his death. The Review of the Times gave the literati access in their own classical language to ideas and events from the world outside China, allowing them to see new options to deal with the crisis in their society. 
Equally influential was the work of the Reverend Timothy Richard of the Baptist Missionary Society, who edited the Eastern Times in Jianjin for a period beginning in 1890 at the invitation of the distinguished literatus Li Hongzhang. Richard grasped better than most Protestant missionaries that the key to China lay with the literati. He dressed as they did. He spent a great deal of time, energy, and money writing, translating, and publishing Christian literature, catechisms, sermons, the New Testament, preparing himself by study of the texts that formed the core of the training for the Chinese national exams. Horrified by a famine he witnessed in the 1870s and the inability of the Manchu regime and its Mandarin agents in the provinces to respond to it, Richard concluded that what China needed above all was the knowledge of modern science that was, with Christianity, one of Western civilization's great fruits. In Pondering Western Civilization, he wrote, I feel that its advantage over Chinese civilization was due to the fact that it sought to discover the workings of God in nature and to apply the law of nature for the service of mankind. I was convinced that if I could lecture the officials and scholars and interest them in these miracles of science, I'd be able to point out to them ways in which they could utilize the forces of God in nature for the benefit of their fellow countrymen. In this way, I could influence them to build railways, to open mines, to avert recurrences of famine, and save the people from their grinding poverty. So was this modernizing Christianity with its vision of science and technology in the service of humanity that shaped the response of the modernizing literati. Kang Yu Wei, that Jinshi who wrote the memorial against foot binding with which I began, once declared, I owe my conversion to reform and my knowledge of reform chiefly to the writings of two missionaries, Reverend Timothy Richard and the Reverend Dr. Allen. But we should be clear it was reform to which he was converted, not Christianity. He remained committed to the Confucian traditions. The westernizing newspapers and journals opened members of the literati like Kang to a more cosmopolitan vision. And it was from among their readers that a second kind of anti-foot binding society developed. Kang wrote in his autobiography that it was the review of the times that introduced him to western ideas beginning in the 1880s and that this was what led him to start thinking about foot binding. He had, he said, been distressed by the pain his sisters underwent when their feet were bound. And so when the time came, he declined, much to the irritation of his wife and his in-laws, to allow the binding of his own daughter's feet. The family urged him to change his mind. Instead, he started an unbound foot association in Guangzhou in 1894 with another member of the literati who had traveled to America and who, like Kang, was not willing to have his own daughter's feet bound. Later, they moved their base of operation to Shanghai, and eventually this Chinese association had more than 10,000 members. And then in 1898, as I said, he made that written appeal to the, empress, to end, to the emperor to end uh, foot binding once and for all. So McGowan represented the lit missionary program, Kang that of the new reforming literati. In the final development of the natural foot movement, there was one more important voice, that of elite expatriate women, the prosperous wives of the businessmen and officials of the commercial, commercial ports on the coast. In the 1890s, Arch uh, McGowan met uh, Mrs. Archibald Little in Shanghai, and inspired by him, she gathered the expatriate elite there, summoned McGowan to speak, and founded a new national anti-foot binding society, which the Tianzu Hui, which Mrs. Little translated as the Natural Foot Society. And uh, Timothy Richard, the Reverend Richard, helped them by producing and publishing their anti-foot binding pamphlets. Mrs. Little had come to China in 1887 after her marriage, She'd already had a successful career under her maiden name, Alice Buick, as the author of satirical novels about the empty social lives of the rich and the follies of the marriage market in Europe. So she had had an independent life as a young woman, and she continued, with her husband's support, an active campaign against footbinding all over China. Perhaps because she was not a missionary, she grasped that the association of anti-footbinding with Christianity in an overwhelmingly Confucian society was a handicap. Her tours through the country were addressed as much as anything else to the literati. In 1900, she succeeded in converting Li Hongzhang, the governor general of Guangzhou, to her cause. But other leading members of the literati found their way to the same conclusion. Zhang Zidong, governor general of Hunan and Hubei, wrote an essay in the famous journal supporting the campaign against footbinding in the 1890s, 
And this text became one of the most powerful weapons in the arsenal of the Natural Foot Society. At one of Mrs. Little's meetings in Wuhan, where she had decorated the hall with huge placards in Zhang's inimitable literary style, uh, one military Mandarin only deigned to study the placard without condescending, apparently, to listen to any of my words of wisdom, but he signed on as a member of the society in the end. The leadership of the Tranjuki was transferred into Chinese hands when Mrs. Little left for England with her ailing husband, and soon after it faded away. But this wasn't because its cause lost support, but because, at least among the upper classes, its arguments had won.